Hey dudes, this is Juliana Donald, Jenny in the Muppets Take Manhattan, and you're listening to Tommy Throwback Kovac on Splat from the Past. Fun fact, Tommy is a Muppet. He poke his navel and he giggles like the Pillsbury Doughboy. Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror and sci-fi show where things could get totally radical. Now today, we are going to be celebrating the 40th anniversary of my favorite Muppet movie, The Great Muppet Caper. I'll be interviewing one of Charles Grodin's accomplice, accomplices in that movie. You remember Carla, Darla, and Marla. Well, I will be interviewing Marla today, er- Erica Creer. And I've been trying to find her for the longest time. I was looking for her when I first started the podcast in 2017, but in the last six months I have found her. And I'm having her on the show today to talk about that movie, talk about, you know, um, Circle of Iron, the movie she made with David Carradine, bit parts in movies like Players and The Dogs of War, and then why she got out of the industry. And it's going to be a great conversation. I love talking to the journeyman. We are going to find out what just what happened to Erica Career, and what the crazy world turning, everything is going to be all right. So yeah, here is my interview with Erica Career. Tommy. Hey, Erica. How are you? I'm good. <laughs> Welcome to the show. How are you today? I'm I'm very good. I'm very hot. It's 23 degrees here. Um, I'm stuck in New Zealand. Yeah. So uh, I'm quite happy. It's the safest place in the world, I believe. Yeah, oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, because it is a crazy time. Um, but I'm glad that uh, we could do this. Thank you so much for taking the time today. Oh, that's my pleasure. Um, what do you want to know? <laughs> so, going back in time, uh, did you gravitate toward acting early on in your childhood? No, in my childhood I wanted to be a veterinary surgeon, and I was actually due to go to university to study that, but I had a big holiday beforehand, you know, waiting for the time to start, so my father, as I was a tomboy, mm-hmm. sent me to finishing school, where I was del- discovered and became a model, quite a well-known model in London. And that was in the late 60s. Wow, so you were a tomboy. I've been hanging out with tomboys my whole life. (laughs) They're the the best, buddy. They're the best. (laughs) They are the best, yes. Oh, my God, they're so much fun. Wow. So, yeah, I figured that you had come from a modeling background because you were so gorgeous, you know, um, back in the day that I I just, I figured that, yeah, you had to be a model. Did you have uh, fun uh, modeling? Oh, yes. I, well, for many, many years, till the 80s, from the 60s, I traveled the world. I was paid for, looked after, fed and watered, and then went to some wonderful countries. And then that followed with me making, you know, included me making a lot of television commercials. And I think that's what prompted people to put me into TV programs or films. But probably, as you say, I was probably was quite good looking. And I think I got the parts because I looked good rather than I was a very accomplished actress. But there you go. It paid the rent. Yeah. Uh, Where was your favorite places to uh, travel to? Uh, Sri Lanka, or it was Ceylon when I went there, but I love Sri Lanka, I love the people, the country, be my chosen, I used to go there for Christmas because there wasn't much work around as a model at Christmas time, so I'd spend most of my Christmases in Sri Lanka for many years, and I took my children there, and I love elephants, and there are quite a few elephants available to play with, so it had everything I, I wanted. Oh, I love elephants too. Yeah, they're such wonderful animals. Mm. I think I think um, you should be credited for for tracking me down because I don't think anybody knows where I've been for the last year stuck in New Zealand. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny because when I started this podcast in 2017, I was looking for uh, people uh, from this movie then, not knowing I would still be doing it four years later, and. Um, I I think I may have found you and some other Erica careers, but I just didn't want to take a chance at that time. But I'm glad I found you now. 
Yes, it's 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 fun. Um, isn't this coming up for an anniversary for the Muppets, the Great Muppet Caper? Yes, forty years. Forty oh years. My goodness. <laughs> don't ask me for too much detail. I don't remember much anymore. I'm that age. <laughs> oh, don't worry. We'll we'll get we'll get to that. But um, did your parents support you getting into um, acting? Well, they supported me indirectly as a model in that they didn't say anything. You know, they were typical old-fashioned Victorian type parents and I just left home and got on with it so um, to their credit under the circumstances they didn't stop me they didn't complain and um, I secretly think my dad basked in the glory whenever my picture was in the newspaper he was a precision engineer so I guess it went down well with his mates you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah so how does um, Circle of Iron come into your life um, Circle of Iron, that was, uh, there's a man called, a director called Richard Moore, I think it was probably his first big movie to direct, and he was in England casting, he probably had seen me in The Muppets, I don't know, um, and I just went to the casting and secured the part hmm. of Tara, um, it's a strange film, mystical, magical, martial arts movie, I suppose, with the um, charismatic David Carradine, he was nice. Um, <laughs> and I was whisked off to Israel uh, for my each. The film was made up of cameos, really, featuring famous people in each cameo, and I was one of those. But unfortunately, at the beginning, um, they filmed my sequence, and when they looked at the rushes, there was a scratch. So I had to wait 12 weeks before they could go back to the location and, and film mine again. So I had 12 weeks in Israel on set and uh, had a ball. Yeah, I was, I was reading that you were actually cast at last minute. Did you know that? No, I didn't know that. But there you go, you see? Pretty face, last minute. I'm just lucky. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I wonder who was originally cast, if there was anybody... But um, that's good that you got cast. Were, were you aware of how big of a star David Carradine was in America? Tommy, I went through the whole of my career being totally unaware of people and, and their importance, if you like, of who I met because I was from the countryside. Um, I left home at 16, but I didn't know anything or anybody. In those days, in the early 60s, it, it wasn't like now, these very aggressive women who just got to get famous and get to the top and yeah. get the best. And I just was thinking, oh, this is good for today. <laughs> I wonder yeah. what's going to happen tomorrow. So, no, I wasn't. Um, and it was always in retrospect that I look back and I think, my goodness, I wonder what they thought of me because I just talked to everybody that they were just me. I, I didn't sort of fate over anybody, but... Um, it was difficult to talk to David. He was very uh, isolated. You know, he just in between scenes, he'd just go and sit down cross legged up a hill and not talk to anybody. But there you go. Yeah, I, I talked to his daughter a couple of years ago. She's very much like him, very eccentric. And, um, yeah, you never know what she's going to say. Uh, but... Yeah, I mean, he was a very talented actor. You know, he was a rebel. I mean, out here, when he was doing Kung Fu, I mean, he he became, you know, a huge star from that. And then after the show was over, he did all these exploitation films and became the king of exploitation films for a long time. Yeah, I, I have to say that as a, a young actress, if you like, I mean, I only had, a, again, a smallish part, cameo part, but it was important at the time. I just felt that when I stood next to him... I could act, you know, he just oozed something about him that made you want to be there and do well. He, he had wonderful charis charisma about him and um, such a sad thing that he had to pass so early. Most of the people, the famous people I work with, they've all gone. Oh, so. yeah. In this movie, you know, there was Christopher Lee, Roddy McDowell, Eli Wallach. I mean, that's a great cast. Absolutely. Um... And what was the guy that I had to pretend to make love to? Jeff Cooper. He's gone, I think. He died. I think so, yeah. 2018. And um, it's, a, it's a very strange world. <laughs> it is. I'm, 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 me, the least famous of all, if you like. I'm the one that's left to talk about it. But, um, 
<laughs> yeah, this movie was actually supposed to be made about 10 years before with um, Bruce Lee and James Coburn, but I guess it, it didn't come to fruition. Did Bruce die? Something happened to him, didn't it? He died in 73, yeah. Yeah, that probably put the scuppers on that. Um, yeah, it would have been interesting to see him in it, though. You um, had a role as a secretary in the movie Players. Oh, yeah. That was a very small part, Tommy. <laughs> <laughs> Day player thing, right? Yeah, um, that was in Monte Carlo. Um, yeah. Yes, that, that was a very small part, but um, as I say, I look right, probably. There you go. Yeah. Um, and but the, the, the Muppets, the, the Muppets was, the, was the first film that... I was so in awe of the professionalism of all the people who work the Muppets. So, you know, it's just how they all work, strapped together under floorboards with a TV screen on their chest, working blind, operating these muppets above them. Yeah. And never a bad word, nothing. They're just so professional. I mean, that taught me a lot as well, to shut up and get on with it, you know? <laughs> yeah. So how, how did that movie come into your life? Was it just a standard audition? Um, well, again, it, yes, it, it was the standard audition. Um, we had the three girls who, who, who featured as the criminals, if you like, or, or, or the, the, the thieves. criminals. Yeah. Marla, Darla, and Carla. We were English <laughs> models, and they just wanted good-looking girls because they had, were playing models in the film, and they were worried that models wouldn't be able to act. So I remember we were all called, and we had to uh, just do cold in the, in the interview room, um, creeping around a room, pretending we were surreptitiously trying to break in somewhere. Yeah. Which is really awful. Um, but the, and, and the three of us, who we vaguely knew each other, um, we secured those parts, the, the lead parts. So quite a lot of models in it, but at least we had the lead parts. And um, it was a smashing film to work on, smashing people. Uh, as I say, so professional. And then, uh, you know, other things. I don't know if you, any of your listeners are historically minded, but Mallory Gallery, where the baseball diamond was hidden. Do you remember that scene? Oh, of course. Yeah. We, we had to break in. I mean, that's Nedworth House. It was a, state, a stately home in England, which um, was used to be the home of Sir Edwin Bulwer-Lytton. And he was first credited as an author of the words it was a dark and stormy night. Huh. Does that mean anything to you over there? Because oh, oh yeah. There, the famous, it's a famous uh, novel that he wrote called Paul Clifford. Yeah. And so that that was his home. So I thought that was quite interesting. And then the other thing about it all was um, he also wrote the words, My, "The pen is mightier than the sword." That yeah. Same, that same man. So uh, it was nice to work at that house. And it's sort of almost gothic. Uh, Tudor goes back to Tudor times. And I did my own stunt work on the roof, where I had to run across the roof and slide down. Mm -hmm. um, so that was quite exciting. That is interesting, yeah. How, how was uh, Jim Henson as a director? Quiet. <laughs> <laughs> quiet. Um, yeah, he was quiet. Uh, I, I, I'm not really sure how to phrase it, um, because everything that you do in a Muppet film... The, the Muppets, at the end of the day, are more important than anybody else. So, when you have a scene, like I had quite uh, several scenes with Miss Piggy, a fight scene and a scene in the dressing room. Yeah. Um, they just kind of, they're the most important part. They almost direct the Miss Piggy, if you like, <coughs> and leave mm -hmm. you to kind of chip in where you can. Um, but it seems to work. I'm quite intelligent. I pick up things quickly. <laughs> <laughs> Did Miss Piggy uh, hurt you too hard when she threw your head down? <laughs> I, thought that, I thought that was so funny because because obviously when you film the scene where she's holding me in my ar in her arms, yeah, and then you know drops me, that's just the way it is. But of course, once you see it in the film with the sound effects of my head hitting the ground, it is it's quite funny. It's quite funny. Oh yeah, I remember. Years ago, I worked in this uh, retail store, and I had this manager who was not very nice. She was a Russian lady, and she was very mean. And I accidentally um, left some uh, some uh, suit hangers 
on the floor, and she f she almost fell on them, and she sounded like you when you're faking twisting your knee. <laughs> it, yeah. it always reminded me of that. <laughs> yeah, that was all a bit over the top, but it had to. That was the, that was the nature of the beast of that film. Yeah, it was. Um, I really enjoyed it. Uh, I have to say, it was it was a, it was a good movie. Yeah. And, and again, you know, the people in it. <coughs> I hadn't heard of Charles Grodin, the lead. The yeah. He, I had I mean, I can't help it. I was very young, and he's not English, but I hadn't heard of him. But he was amazing, and um, you know, John Cleese, Peter Ustinov, Robert Morley, Peter Falk, my oh, hero yeah. as a child, watching him Columbo. I used to be allowed to watch that as a kid, and oh, it was fantastic. Meet all those people. Oh yeah, it's got a wonderful cast of uh, English legends in there, but. Uh, yeah, Charles Grodin, he did a radio interview, I want to say about 10 years ago, something like that, where um, he's talking about this movie, and he, you know, he said, he said in, a, in a joking way that you know, uh, uh, him and Miss Piggy were in his hotel suite during off-duty hours and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> he's, very, he's quite dry, and I just love him. He, he was fantastic, yeah. Yeah, because he's just he's just so funny, you know, just having a crush on a, on a pig puppet like that. <laughs> but just in the film, the way he was talking, you know, falling in love with her, it, it, I mean, it's just it was tongue in cheek, but it was it worked. It, it was very good. I think that actually was was that not first film that feature film that Jim Jim Henson directed. It was the first one he directed, but it was the second Muppet movie overall. Yeah, so he was finding his feet a bit probably there as well. Oh yeah, he he did. You know, he went on to do the Dark Crystal and Labyrinth, which were more darker kind of adult, you know, puppet uh, movies. But um, yeah, this was the only Muppet movie that he got to direct. Mm. You, um, you, Kate Howard and Della Finch are also good playing these sexy jewel thief models. Uh, did you all know each other before? Well, I knew Kate um, as a model. I was quite well known in those days, and I used to do a lot of work on my own. I very rarely worked with other girls, but Kate and I were quite similar in appearance, and I had worked with her before. Now, Della, I hadn't met before, and she, but now she's my still my friend, still my mate. I visit, you know, we meet up in London quite often, um, and she looks not one dot different. She's as slim and as beautiful and as clear-skinned and everything. She, you wouldn't believe it. She's amazing. Oh, nice. She hasn't changed. I'm, 70, I'm 73 and wrinkly, and there's Della, you know. She's just <laughs> amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's so great that you're still in contact. Yeah, I lost track of Kate, but I think she had children. She had she had a little boy at the time when we were on the set, and then I think she had some more children later, so I don't know what happened to her. I lost track, because I, I moved out of London eventually, because... Um, I had ch I had children late in life, and I just realised having a nanny, I was missing out on so much. So I stopped that kind of work and moved to the country and brought up my kids. Yeah. So you don't. Um, so what I love about the three of you working together is that you don't play it sinister. You play it really silly and cartoony. Well, it was silly and cartoony. I mean, it is the Muppets, isn't it? You know? I mean, yeah. if, we, if we tried to play it dead serious, we'd have stood out like sore thumbs. I mean, Charles didn't play it serious. Diana didn't. Diana Rigg. You know, it was all Tom in cheek and over the top. So we just followed suit. We weren't given, I don't think, that much direction, really. But we were just told this is what it is and this is what you do. And then we did it. And I, I don't remember very many retakes or anything at all. It just went quite smoothly. We just lost uh, Diana Rigg. Uh, how was working with her? Um, <laughs> the, um, tricky. Tricky. Use, yeah. I mean, just are you there? Yeah. No, it does diva mean anything to you? Yes, it does. <laughs> that's not that's not derogatory. She's probably entitled to it, but it was hard. It's hard. Yeah. So she's like her character, basically. Yeah, we didn't, although we were in lot of scenes with her, she didn't really mix with us, you know what I mean? I don't know what to say. <laughs> no, I get it, I get it. 
Uh, she was uh, on YouTube. There's a, um, a a clip of her on a talk show in England in the '70s uh, talking about about um, uh, changing her baby's diapers. It's so hilarious. She had a really good sense of humor. It seemed like, but that's that's pretty sad that uh, she was a diva like that, though. Well, it's, as I say, it's, it's you know we were only we we were all novices in the film business at that time, and she probably just thought, let's get on with it. And, yeah. Where's my? I mean, I don't blame. I'm not. It's not a criticism particularly, but I just think she's a bit terrifying. But that's only because she's so positive and loud, and uh, and we're just not used to that. It's not. You know, she's very theatrical. There you go. That's nicer, isn't it? She's theatrical. Was theatrical. Yeah. Oh, I, I believe me. I've interviewed people who have had that. Let's get. Let's get on with it. Attitude. You know. Um, yeah. You know. It. 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 It does disappoint me. You know. But sometimes. Um, I'll I'll have them in the palm of my hand by the end of the interview. So, but it it could it could be kind of crushing. I I understand. But but I I have to say that again as a kid, the Avengers, brilliant. She was brilliant, and she's been in so many uh, plays on television here that was very very good. Just difficult in the personal relationship. But why should she like or get on with everybody? You know. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> I love it when you say to Darla, did you just give directions to a frog? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, then there's another line in the other film, The Circle of Iron, yeah. Silent Flip, it has two names for some reason, um, where, I'm not sure how you pronounce it now, his name, Eli Waller? Eli Waller? Eli Wallach, Eli yeah. Wallach, yeah. He's in a barrel of oil trying to dissolve his manhood because he thinks it's a bad thing to have. And... You know, we come across him in the desert, just in the middle of nowhere, in this desert, in the barrel of oil. Yeah. And the guy says to him, what are you doing to yourself? It's terrible. And he says, it's fine, I'm dissolving my manhood or whatever. He says, trust me, I'm a doctor. This is Eli Wallach. And I yeah. just thought, it's such a good line, trust me, I'm a doctor. It's perfectly all right to stand in the barrel of oil in the middle of the desert and dissolve your manhood. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Was there a lot of um, waiting around because the Muppets required special handling? Yes, um, but, the, but but having said that, they are ninety nine percent of the movie, so yeah, uh, th th there is a lot. But yes, it's just setting up the way they do their sequences because it's it's quite scary that if you're doing a moving sequence like the fight scene I had with Miss Piggy, all the all the people dancing, the characters. The Muppet characters move forward or left and right, but the people are underneath, under the floor. So the floorboards come up and go down to allow yeah. for for the real like for the real people to walk as well. So it's it's like a jigsaw puzzle, and it's so complicated in a way, and it could go horribly wrong, but it never did. Um, yeah, it's, it's good. Mm -hmm. Mag it's magic to me. I don't know how they did it. It was magic, yeah. Uh, that that um, that heist at the uh, at the Mallory Gallery must have been insane because, just you know, having all these Muppets, you know, around and they're just you know trying to get that diamond, you know, all over you guys and you know it's like a f they're they're acting like it's a football game, rah rah rah. <laughs> oh, I know it's fantastic. I think I got the worst wound, didn't I? I got punched or something. Not I had to get knocked backwards and fall flat on my back. First time I'd done that. Yeah. But there was a. <laughs> a spongy thing to land on um yeah i did a lot of firsts in that movie but it was very exciting i love the bit where she comes flying through the air through the stained glass window and drops into the gallery it's um it's really good it's so much stunt work <laughs> that you don't realize goes on um uh, there's another uh, in the um, other film i learned that uh, david had to david carradine had to knock out with a with a, a hand movement um a great big Ox, I think it was, and um, in the desert, and he did it, and the ox fell to the ground. But what had happened was they put the ox standing on a carpet and covered it in sand. So when David went to hit him, they just pulled the carpet, and the poor thing just collapsed onto its knees. But again, it's stunt work and it's magic, but it was lovely. <laughs> yeah, an animal. He liked you a lot. He's like laying on top of you, laughing. <laughs> Yeah, wriggly little, wriggly little animal. Yes. Um, I'm wondering who 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 did the words for, 
animal. It was Frank, wasn't it? Frank Oz was animal. Yes, he his was. Voice, his voice. Not that he was lying on top of me. No, it was animal, no. but it was his voice. <laughs> yeah, he. It was. Uh, yeah, because he was Miss Piggy, Fozzie, Animal, and I think that's it. Maybe a couple others. Who knows? But um, he, was, he was a Swedish chef. I remember that. Oh yeah. <laughs> The, the Swedish chef. Think, it's funny. We used, used to think he looked a bit like a Swedish chef. That's quite funny. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. This this movie has just impacted me since I was three years old. I used to watch it over and over again, and I still have the tape it was on. I have taken care of it over the years, along with the other Muppet movies that are on it. And um, six years ago, I had a bad car accident, and I broke my leg in seven places, and. Uh, towards the end of my stay in the hospital, I put um, the movie on um, my laptop in the hospital, and um, when Kermit and Fozzie are doing that song, Stepping Out with a Star, it motivated me to get out of the hospital bed and try to start walking, because the medication that they gave me gave me such an attitude, like I didn't want to do it, and plus, you know, I was under so much anesthesia from the pain and everything that that song really like helped me like get out of bed and, and start walking again and i owe it all to that song <laughs> oh that's that's wonderful news that, that that's what happens though something suddenly inspires you um somehow and um, that's great i'm sure i'm sure that um the whole team jim and that they, they'd you know, be pleased about that yes I, i've talked to a couple of the puppeteers but not from this a uh, particular movie I've talked to it from uh, Fraggle Rock, um, the Canadian uh, puppeteers that they had. They're they're the nicest ones. The ones who like worked on this one, you know, they're protected by management and what have you. I haven't been able to talk to them, but um, I did talk to the Fraggle Rock puppeteers. They're very nice. Yeah, well, our, our, our group seemed very nice to me. Um, as I say, I was just so impressed that under the conditions there was no arguments or complaints it was um, very, very good um, yeah yeah I mean, a lot of the critics didn't like this particular one because they they thought that the humans had more screen time than the Muppets. But I don't I don't agree with that at all. I think that they had equal amount of screen time. Well, I think the, the weight the weight that Charles Grodin and and um. Oh, what's her name? <laughs> Di- Di- Diana Rigg. <laughs> Diana Rigg. I, I blocked her, sorry. Um, the, the weight that they added to the movie I thought was very important, and um, so I think it worked well. And, uh, uh, yeah, so I don't know what to say, but I have to say that every Christmas a Muppet movie appears in one shape or form but it, uh, on TV here, but it's only once, to my knowledge, being the great Muppet caper. It's always been the other ones, uh, the more popular ones for some reason. So there you go. Have Have your children or grandchildren seen it? My, I don't have grandchildren, but my children have seen it. Yes, it's on CD now, of course. And also at the time, I had a big poster that they all signed, that you know, Frank and, and Jim. And also, I've got a book with some pictures about the movie, and there's some pictures of me in that. So they they've um, you know they know they know everything I've done, good or bad, in my career. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, it's quite hard sometimes explaining to children why you do things, really. But they're grown up now and they understand. I paid the school fees. <laughs> do you remember being a day player on the Dogs of War? I uh, yeah, that was really great. It was very exciting. It was only a small part again, but it was at a dinner table, wasn't it? And, and, um, yeah. Yeah, but um, it was really scary that scene because we were at the table with that. I can't remember the details now, but that dead person came flying in or something. I don't know what happened. But anyway, it was very exciting and very dark. Uh, and I enjoyed that little bit that I did. Um, I've, I, in between all of this, I did more TV work. I did comedy shows with um, a Canadian man called Kelly Monteith. I oh, yeah. Know. I was in a few of his um, shows. I don't think, again, England took to his comedy very well. Um, and if you, when, when you look back, because I've got some of the tapes, when you look back, it looks a bit amateurish, but then everything does, doesn't it, when you go backwards in time, because things are so improved now, technically, and what you can say and do as well. Um, yeah. 
Well, I mean, generally, the, the English, they seem to um, like uh, Canadian artists. Um, there's a, there's a stand-up comedian named Stuart Francis. He's Canadian, and he's pretty popular um, in England. He makes all these really funny and sometimes bad puns, you know. He says things like, uh, you know, people think I'm a plagiarist. Their words, not mine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right, okay, yeah. I mean, I, I watch, um, because I'm stuck in New Zealand at my daughter's house, I watch old programs from England uh, to pass the time sometimes, and there's a question program called um, The Chase. Have you heard it a bit over in California? The Chase. Chase. No, anyway, it doesn't mm. matter, but or, I was just going to say, mentioning Canadians, um, there's always questions about which Canadian singer did this or that and it's always the answer is always drake have you heard of that rapper called drake yes Maybe drake yeah. <laughs> yeah and my daughter said whatever it is mommy because i know nothing about things like that she said whatever it is mommy just say drake <laughs> <laughs> it's canadian just say drake <laughs> <laughs> So you mentioned before that, um, you know, you left the industry and had a family. Um, what, what, so initially, was that the, the motivation to leave or was there other reasons? Uh, no, I had become, throughout my career, I was the muse, if you like, of a very well, well, famous photographer called John Cowan, uh -huh. who worked for Time Life and American Vogue. And... Um, I worked, for, I, I just was interested in photography and in between modeling work, he used to book me as a model, but I, I learned a lot. He taught me to print, he used to send me out with a roll of 36 millimeter and say, come back with 36 perfect shots. Um, we lived in New York for a while. And um, when he died, he left me all his equipment and everything. So I became really a photographer. Mm -hmm. I, fa I slowly faded out my modelling work uh, to be a photographer and I worked in Fleet Street with the newspapers as a freelance and I would take pictures of the rich and famous but not paparazzi pictures, they would be by appointment yeah. and um, they still needed that kind of stuff for newspapers so I did that for a long time, then I decided I wanted children so I organised that and, um, and then eventually when they were school age I moved out of London because I didn't really want them brought up in London, because times were changing then. My God, they've changed a lot since, but they were <laughs> changing then in the in late 80s. And so I, I moved out, and then I just looked after my children and did jobs. I worked for the Hereford Times, which is a county newspaper in Herefordshire, which is a rural uh, county, so there's a lot of cattle and apple growing and potato growing and things and I just worked as a, a freelance journalist um, there uh, for quite a while and um, and then eventually after 17 years I thought I don't know it's a bit isolated here in the countryside so I'll go back to a town so I moved back to the Midlands in England and that's I just nipped away a month for a month in February last year mm -hmm. and um, got caught in lockdown here and I'm still here but I have to go back now because my visa's up I can't extend it. Mm -hmm. It feels like I'm going home to a death sentence. The COVID situation is very bad in England, evidently. Yeah. Oh, my God. I've talked to a few people in England over the last um, year or so, and, yeah, they have told me it's pretty scary over there. But um, they, say, they say one in 30 have got it now, but I don't know. Yeah. Oh, my God. That is insane. Um yeah, did you uh, did you unco uh, uncover any um, celebrity scandals while you were a journalist? Uh, not so much scandals. I mean, I, I mean, in fact, one went to, one I did. It went to court, and it, it was settled out of court because I was correct. But I don't suppose I should talk about them. Now. Okay. <laughs> it, it, it involved um, yeah, a bug named member of a group. Um, anyway, just a few, but I was a nice photographer, you know, I was nice, I made people look good, and I didn't sell stories that were bad, it was just this one fell in my lap, and it was ridiculous, it was me or somebody else to get it, you know, I was right there, but um, I was I was good, you know, I just wrote nice stories, and or nice bylines, and took pictures of people looking good, I didn't try and catch anyone in compromising, because I, I used to have people try and do that to me, and it's horrible, I hated it, that's what I don't like about the profession now and why I, I was glad to get out before it became this Me Too movement and oh. 
everyone's telling stories about everybody and, 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 and all this, what's it called, trolling, trolling? Yeah, trolling. Oh, it's... I didn't know any of that but when I was working. It was not like that. I was just very professional, did the job, went home and carried on. It, it's not like that now. And I couldn't live up to the standard of trying to 24-7 be this fake person who puffed up lips and raised eyebrows and white, shiny teeth. I mean, I don't understand it. Why can't you just be people? <laughs> I know it's 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 crazy, you know. Uh, I've I've run into a lot of that, you know, and stuff. I've you know I tell dirty jokes on the show all the time to, you know, male and female guests all the time and stuff, you know. And occasionally I'll tell it to someone who was uncomfortable by it, you know. And then I'll hear about it later and all this crap and everything. But you know i'm i'm being i'm being respectful and i'm being a gentleman i'm not being a pig or anything you know and so that's my style and that's what i'll continue doing you know just this me too movement has has a lot of discrepancies in it i feel well i just find it ludicrous because, mainly because it's dated goes back so so many years i you know i have the odd i think i had three problems in my career and i just dealt with them you know, yeah. I wouldn't think of repeating them or, or bringing them up now or trying to sell a story. I mean, what the heck? I can't believe it. I'm just shocked by it all. I just don't like that, and I certainly don't like to say... Um, I, th I was brought up, if you can't say anything good about someone, don't say anything at all. Um, yes, I can tell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that's... To, be fair, to, to be fair, Tommy, you can't like everybody, and everybody can't like me. And my yeah. best friend girlfriend, my best friend, my girl, a girlfriend of mine, my best friend really for many, 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 many years, she says about my, me, she says, you know the problem with you? And I say, no, what's my problem? She says, well, you're like Marmite. People either like you or hate you. And I bring that out in people. So I have a lot of, res and I, am, I accept that and I understand it. And I have a lot of respect for people who don't take to me, don't like people talking about, I, I met someone the other, a few years ago, who was talking about me to me. Mm hmm and I, I, they obviously never met me because they were telling me about me. Yeah. So I think, what is all that about? Oh, but, yeah. Um, I, I've got a lot of patience for people, and, and I try to accept them as they are. And I mean, I've got a big mouth sometimes. I just say what I think. But I try and do it with a little bit of forethought. But it, I'm getting a bit worried now. You can't say anything. People I know. I know you you can't say anything these days. It's just it's it's insane, you know. And it's all brought on because of one man, you know, the president that we have here in America. Which, you know, hopefully, you know, after what happened this past week, you know, he's gonna get uh, what's coming to him, you know, in in a, in, a, in a week and a half when uh, the new president takes over. What's he gonna do? What's Trump going to do? <laughs> I, I I don't know. I mean, he's banned from Twitter. Um, you know, they, they're scared, they're is scared. From, is he banned from the bedroom, the American bedroom? <laughs> <laughs> Probably. <laughs> Come on, tell me, tell me, tell me. That's what we all want to know. But, is she for real, this woman? <laughs> I don't know, but he's banned from Twitter, and, you know, they're still scared about impeaching him and prosecuting him. I don't know what he's going to do next, but um, I did see a post earlier that he was thinking about uh, starting his own social media company after <laughs> his presidency is over, and it's like, oh my god, this this man is crazy. It's a bit like Meghan Markle. I want to like Trump, and I want to like Meghan Markle, and I want them to be good presidents and good representatives of the royal family, but yeah. my goodness, it's hard. It's hard. It's, I don't know, hard. Can't they go to an island somewhere, the pair of them? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so how are things over there in, um, in New Zealand? Well, do you know, it's well, 24 degrees, it's bright sunshine, and it will be until about 9 o'clock tonight. It's about half past 3 now. Um, it's so nice. I live near Lake Taupo, which is a big lake on the North Island, so I can just wander down there and go for a swim when it's too hot. Mm -hmm. um, my daughter lives here permanently, so uh, you know she's on her. She's working, works every day. So every day for the last year, I've renovated completely and re-landscaped their whole garden, which has given me a reason to get up in the morning and, and something to do. Because at home, all my friends are getting depressed. They're locked in. They're it's tier four lockdown. Can't go out. Can't speak to anybody. 
it's terrible. I'm really worried for their mental state. And I'm here having a ball, really. You know, I can't complain. It's like it's the best nursing home in the world because she cooks for me, looks after me. Oh, that, that is sweet. I'm, I'm glad you two have a good relationship. Oh, yeah. Yeah. She, does, she doesn't want me to go back, but I have to now. I can't stay any longer than a year. I came for a month, and they've been very good. I reckon Jacinda Ahern, the, the president, prime minister, she saved my life by keeping the country safe. But I've got to go back, unfortunately, so I don't know what's going to happen. This may be the last time anybody speaks to me live. Oh, don't, don't say that, Erica. Don't say that. Same time next year, you have to check on me. Check I'm still around. <laughs> I will I, I will check on you, Erica, I promise. Yeah. I do I I do have an elephant joke for you. Go on. What did the elephant say to the naked man? Oh, put your trunk on. No, put your trunks on? No. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> People always guess that. No, it's man, how can you breathe through that thing? Oh, okay. <laughs> American. Not, the funniest, not the funniest one, Tommy, but don't take the hump. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's American humor. I, I've told it to a lot of people. They love it. <laughs> oh, no, no, it is funny. It's great. And it's nice. That's what I like. It's nice. Unfortunately, in England, all the comedians that told what I call jokes like that and, and were just funny, and, and they walked on stage and you laughed, even if they hadn't done anything, they've all gone. They've all died, and it's very crude and very rough and very insulting sometimes. And I worry about I worry about the whole flipping country, really. But there you go. I grew up on Monty Python and Benny Hill and all those guys. Mm. Well, that was tame compared to what we have now. I mean, it was quite shocking at the time. <laughs> well, that's what I love about about Europeans is that they're so free spirited. They have no shame. You know, I mean, we have no shame too, but we're censored, and you guys are not censored. I remember tw well, twenty years ago seeing a show on HBO where everyone in England and Japan and Australia and all these places did all these talk shows where everyone was naked and performing sex acts. And I'm like, God, why can't we have that out here? This is so awesome. <laughs> There's a program on um, television in England called Naked Attraction. Mm -hmm. And I don't watch much television, and I'm, and I'm a bit of a prude anyway. But <laughs> I, one night, I couldn't sleep. It's on late at night, and I did found it on one of the channels low down on the screen. And it's people who absolutely start naked, and somewhat, there's like five of them, I think, and then someone comes on looking for a partner. So they, they look at them in stages. They look at their under beneath, the middly bits, and then their face, and then they choose, by process of elimination, one to go out with. I was so shocked because they go close up into all their private bits and they talk about them and everything. And um, I phoned up my daughter and I said, there's this shocking program on television. I can't believe it. It's called Naked Attraction. How can they do that? She said, well, mum, if the clue is in the title, it's Naked Attraction. You know, yeah. I just couldn't <laughs> believe that, that I'm looking at all these different bodies, male and female. So you have to look out for that one. Oh, I'll check it out. Yeah, if I can find it. Well, Erica, I thank you so much for coming on today. And please stay safe because we need wonderful ladies like you out there. And have a safe return home to England. Thank you very much. And you stay safe over there, Tommy. And great to speak to you. And I'm glad you found me. Thank you. Absolutely. If you want to um, add me as a friend on Facebook, you may. Okie dokie. I'll um, try and do that. I'm not very good at all these things. Okay, well, lots of love. Bye for now. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. Well, there you have it. Erica Creer. Ain't she a sweetheart? What a nice lady, huh? And her story has a happy ending there, you know, sacrificing her career for her family and finding another career in journalism. That is just so amazing. Well... That's all time we have this week on Splat from the Past. Till next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying, There's no shame in living in the past. Because the present sucks. Later, dudes. Ra, ra, ra. Ha, 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 ha.